you who live here. I just want to thank everyone for uh, showing up, being here. Thank Kansas City. Thanks for the support. Thank Aaron, Tiffany. There's like so many names and audience members that I could really thank. You, you all know who you are. Uh, but let's get this uh, slide presentation on the road. Uh, this is me. <laughs> I came to Kansas City in 2007, not knowing what Kansas City was or is or having any, any expectations of it. Uh, I came to the Kansas City Art Institute really to study s painting, and then I ended up studying ceramics because I felt that there was something uh, connecting me to like home. Also ceramics to me was like cooking. And so I had a lot of uh, aunts and uncles and we all, you know, I was, a, as a child growing up, I was a bit chubby because I was eating from everyone, you know, always. And so like cooking was a big part of my family. And so I felt like ceramics was bringing me back to that sort of like uh, sentiment. Um, and I'm, I, I will not show any images from while I was in school. Uh, but this, this, this slide presentation will be images that started after uh, my time ended at KCI. Here we have uh, World History's Ancestral Transients from 2011, I believe. Uh, and this was a work that was included in reform at the, uh, the Kansas City Art Institute H&R Block Art Space, curated by Catherine Footer, former decorative arts curator at Nelson Atkins Museum. And with this, I was really thinking about being a, a transient person, coming from the Caribbean, thinking about also just the, the various ideas of leisure and uh, the blue ocean, you know, thinking about cargo, thinking about, you know, wealth and different ways of, uh, Transferring power. I feel like you guys should ask me questions while I'm going <laughs> along with this, you know. And so it's comprised of a metal barrel, oil inside a drum, and a ceramic figure. And while I was doing this, I was really thinking about home and what it means to, you know, who am I? Where did I come from? You know, looking at my family history. And I was looking at a lot of uh, family photos and painting from those photos. And I was starting out, you know, like I studied ceramics, but I was starting to like dabble into painting and trying to understand what, what, what I, am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to appeal to? And even while I was a student at KCI making ceramics, I would paint in the apartment at home, you know, like I would have a job so that I, I could purchase supplies to paint outside of like what was being uh, taught or learned at the time. And these were, these were works that I showed around Kansas City and if they were in a gallery for a while, I'd go back and collect them because I wanted to hold on to them. And so most of these works I'm showing you in the beginning, you know, are paintings that I made back then. And they're all life size, like this one, sorry to go back. It's about life size, like 32 by 24, somewhere around there. And then this one bumped up in the scale about 68 by 50. And then now I'm painting with oil on canvas. And then you've probably seen these tarmac workers where I was going back to Jamaica, seeing these tarmac uh, workers. Uh, and I was thinking of them being sort of like these diplomats while I was coming back home. So I would take photos of them. And at this time I had a studio with the Charles Street Foundation uh, I think at a power, not, I forget the name of the space, but I was making these paintings at that time and also was trying to merge, you know, trying to figure out what I was really doing. But I think what I was really trying to speak about was immigration and how I, Paul Anthony Smith, left Jamaica when I was, when I was nine, came to America, trying, you know, like I had to assimilate you know, when I was here at KCI, I would call back home and my father would be like, Paul, you're not, you don't sound like, you don't sound Jamaican anymore. Or like, you don't sound, and I was like, I was like, dad, what do you mean? And he's like, Paul, talk to me. They would usually talk to me. 
I'm like, Dad, what do you mean? I was like, I said, Paul, speak, you know, speak to me no more. You know, I talk like I usually talk to me, and then it was just like, holy shit, like, you, you realize that something has changed because like, like when I was at KCI, I realized that I was assimilating to what I was being taught. I was writing differently. I didn't go back home for breaks. I would stay in the studios and work like right over here in the uh, ceramic department or I'd work at the art space or, you know, I always had jobs that helped me to become better at what I did. And that's what I find the most interest in at the time. And you may have seen these. Erin actually uh, included these in a show back in 2014 at the Kemper's, Cross, former, the Kemper's former Crossroads location. And these are uh, oil on canvas, roughly life size, 72 by 96. And at the same time, I was working on, uh, I guess the picotage technique started in 2012 while I was at Anderson Ranch Art Center. And most of the images that I was using were images of my mom. She moved to London and was sending me her passport, uh, or visa image, passport photos for her visa, updating visas. And I would collect them over time. And I have this way of like uh, collecting information through images and then rescanning them, blowing them up, and sort of uh, repurposing them in some ways. And I was blowing these up from these one by one and a half by two images to these larger 32 by 24 images. And for me, it was a really, just to, again, to another way of speaking about immigration, but also using these masters in the Kuba tribe from the Democratic Republic of Congo to speak about how to, you know, Disguise yourself as a queen, but also think about the hierarchy and the systems that are in place. And I presented these at the uh, McKinney Avenue Contemporary in Dallas, Texas, spring 2013, along with uh, the, the paintings of the tarmac workers. And these are now images going on into 2014, right when I moved to New York. Um, we began picking more, this one's also inside the gallery right now, picking at these images very aggressively, distorting them, thinking much about how to hide the presence and the figures within these picture planes, because pictures are meant to reveal information. And I think I got really into taking images and presenting images, because I worked on the Hallmark photo collection at the Nelson Atkins Museum, working in the archives, and I began to, again, have this obsessed nature of looking at images and thinking about how pictures were, you, you know, paintings were made in the 16th and 17th centuries to what pictures are today. And so I was trying to, you know, elevate the picture, but also create this sculptural element around it but also break it down into this pulp -like information. And a lot of these images I took while traveling back home to Jamaica because in some ways, like, you have this, uh, you go on trips, vacations, and you have these memories of these people, but also you have these Kodak moments. And for me, it's kind of like part of what happens as an immigrant and moving to a new place is that your memory of these places are eroded. And so I'm trying to erode these images um, in the way that memory functions, you know. You guys are quiet. <laughs> and so they, the same images ended up in these silkscreen uh, collage canvases that I was uh, Silk screening and then taking them back to the studio and cutting them up into these cryptic, confused moments. And so you could see that some of the same images re repeats in the silk screens. And that was me thinking about home again and how home, you, you know, going back home, I've seen a lot of houses where, you know, the grandfather, like my grandfather, left this house and my 
my mom's generation builds on it. And then now I have my generation adding to it, adding to it. And so for me, it's kind of like thinking about architecture and how over time, you know, uh, there's new additions, like a lot, probably a good amount of you here probably bought a house and add, added on additions to the house. And then you could see the difference throughout the history of the house and how it becomes kind of like complicated. I don't know if that makes sense. And so that's what I was trying to talk about whenever I went back home, you know, like, now I'm living in America, I'm going back home, I'm seeing uh, things in a different light and just how confusing it is. And it's still that way going back home, not my family, but just other families that I've spoken to or have seen and just how houses are very complicated. Uh, and so that's how I started collaging these images, you know. And then I had to show it the gallery. I built this wall, uh, painted the other side, showed some of these images. And I think one of the interesting things is that sometimes we make things, but we have no idea what they are until years afterwards, you know. And, and I'm starting to realize that, like, I make a lot of stuff. I make a lot of stuff that I don't show, but Usually, you know, the thoughts of them, my thoughts accumulate years afterwards. Uh, and it's all, it, it catches up with what I was thinking at the time. And oftentimes I, like in the other room or in the gallery, uh, I present two or three different types of works together because that's how my mind's my mind is really functioning at the time. It's not really thematic, you know, like in the studio right now, I'm painting, I'm printing, I'm collaging, I'm picking, I'm doing all sorts of things, but it's just, it's all part of the same practice. It's 2015 at Expo Chicago. 2016 at, uh, Providence College. I was invited by Jamie Lee Paulson, who was an interim curator here at the Charles Street Foundation. Um, and I was invited to do this project called On the Wall, and then I, I took some of those same images that I was actually working with. I went to Costco. At the time, Costco was one of my biggest friend because the, the four by six prints there were uh, so it's like 12 cents a print. So I think I printed like, a. 1,200 prints or something like that. <laughs> and then I drove up to Providence and uh, chalk lined this room because again, I'm thinking about uh, domestic spaces and structures and castles and how to protect them. But also at the same time in 2016, there was a lot of talk about borders and walls and, you know, gentrification. It's, these are topics that are, you know, always in the American landscape. So, and so I was like really thinking about how to, what was I doing? I didn't really know what I was doing. I just went in painted a wall yellow because of the mango that was in, the mango yellow that was in other works that, are, uh, that came from going back home at a certain time. And using these four by six images to create these uh, wall patterns, these brick patterns, that really continued on to become, uh, enter these other works. And these works are now called Blurred Lines, where I was thinking about, uh, this, these works came out of, having student loans being deferred. And having to, I remember when I was here once, uh, I, would, I had a call, because I wasn't paying my loans. No one pays their loans on time. And I had a call, and my loans got sold off to a few different companies. And like, you know, when you're, when you're young, you don't read the fine print. Same thing with mortgages, right? Does anyone read the fine print or credit card statements, car notes? And I was thinking about how no one reads the fine print. So you just sign off on whatever it is. And it's kind of confusing. Only lawyers write these uh, fine prints like medical insurance. I'm sure most of you guys don't read them properly. I don't. Uh, and so I was just thinking about the gesture of signing off on these prints. And so I was taking my images again. Everything that I do comes from a photograph, right? We live in the, uh, the photo era where everything's on video surveillance. I have three cameras here tonight recording me, probably four. Uh, and so I was thinking about those images and how to break them down in these low algorithm bandwidths because of the way how my old iPhone functioned. And so I was making these blots of these images and how they loaded in my computer screen 
by using uh, a lower uh, pixel in Photoshop. And then I was using oil sticks to recreate these in a painting, but also making them in a way as I, uh, signatures to create these um, broken picture planes. And this is now 2016. And I showed these uh, at a gallery in Milan then, called Brand New Gallery. These paintings were out 84 by 60. So they were large. And it was also like I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and I was seeing a lot of development happen around me. And it was always on my mind. Like you'd walk down the street one day, you see a building, you come back next day, it's gone. And then you'd see like, you know, the price of rent was skyrocketing. And that same fall, I made this work with a chain link fence. The chain link fence actually started here while I was in Kansas City because I would, you know, I'd drive out to East KC, find a place I sold chain link fences, bring it back to the studio, make sense out of it. Um, and then this one uh, I made in 2016 for a group show in London. And in these images, I was photographing Puerto Rico, but also taking the bead curtains that were in my aunt's and my grandfather's entryway and photoshopping them over these images to think about just how spaces are broken up uh, and how to think about borders and walls and all these spaces that we have. This one is uh, Kosciusko. I used to live on Kosciusko Street in Brooklyn, and this is uh, the facade of the Kosciusko pool. So I was like photographing my neighborhood and really thinking about how the neighborhood is changing and how to document that within my daily process of picking these images. And you know, picking these images all day in the studio is kind of like meditative. It's like you can't get enough of it, you know? You listen to Miles Davis kind of blue and just pick all day. And then now 2017, I think I took this image in 2016 and presented in January 2017. Um, but all the, the, in all the years I've lived in New York, I would always miss the West Indian, West Indian Labor Day Parade uh, in Brooklyn. And a few years prior, I started photographing them, uh, the processions and capturing mo moments of uh, sort of like these spiritual moments that really invoked dance. And these are now 96 by 47 each. But I wanted them to, I want the magnitude of them to be, you know, I want them to be on a larger scale so that you could feel the presence of these individuals marching, sort of like down the street or at you. I grew up around the church, in the church, so that I was thinking about the, the, the wall of Jericho from the Bible and uh, these women's marching and the sounds of the music. You see them, but like for me, I, when I look at them, I think about the music that's being played, the loud sounds, the drums beating. And so I'm thinking about them breaking down these walls and breaking, uh, breaking down these barriers. Um, which is why the walls are broken up into these diamond patterns, but the diamond patterns also goes back to the Kuba masks that I was showing in the early image of the uh, passport photos. And this image here is a, a street vendor, you know, had spilled the soup from uh, this parade, and I thought it brought me back to this image of Irving Penn. When I worked at the Nelson Atkins Museum, I remember I took this image out from the portfolio box. I opened it, and right when I opened it, I started to cry because of the, uh, the intensity of seeing this image in that portfolio box while I was working to get it photographed. And I felt there was something connecting me back to this image from that moment. You know, they're about four years, four or five years apart. But 
it's this person's like, you know, the meal that they're serving for that day at the West Indian Day Parade. And so I picked it as, you know, like you want to remove that memory of what happened. And there's a lot of uh, textures and other patterns in some of these work that you can't really see, but you have to see them at various angles. And most of my picking comes from the idea of uh, assimilating, hiding, camouflage, early 19th century dazzle that was used on a lot of maritime ships, submarines, and vessels of that nature. And so I was thinking pretty much about how to camouflage images. Like nature is about camouflaging. You know, if we leave this building right now and abandon it for 10, 20 years, it, nature get, you know, takes its course and go back to its natural being. And so I was thinking very much about that. And what does nature mean? You know, the sentiment of growth. Uh, that's what the greenery is, you know. This one's called Cien Blind, Trickery Cien Blind Here and Deaf. It's like see no evil, hear no evil. I think this one's called Invisibly Come at a Cost from 2018. And a lot of these titles come from books that I've read or uh, taken quotes and mimicked what I was reading. And now this is another, I haven't shown this work, I've seen this work in a while, but it's uh, Intelligence Never Kill No One. And this is, you know, it's, it's kind of like some of these, with, sorry, with some of these, it's all about, they're all about surviving. You know, in here I have a few graveyards that are flipped upside down, but people are enjoying it enjoying themselves and, and dancing, but everyone, you know, I thought about death a whole lot when I was making these works, and oftentimes we see a lot of death in the media and the news, and it's just, you know, thinking about what's the purpose of life, how do we live and enjoy uh, the daily moments that we have. And this one, I believe, is called Ideas Can Lead to Actions, and some actions are magic, I think from 2018, and it's just thinking about, you know, freeing your body from all, you know, all the stresses of life through dance, and just how dance could, you know, really elevate you. Uh, it's like dance is another form of working out. And a lot of these images uh, are of the West Indian Day Parade in Brooklyn, and thinking about the junction of uh, the Caribbean, like the French, the British, the Spanish, and how the Caribbean is made up of all these uh, colonies, colonizers, colonies, uh, countries, and how just pretty much, you know, the identity of these people are not a monolith. You know, black isn't a monolith. There's all different forms of black. And with these works, you can't really see it very distinct distinctively in this image, but I use the 13 stripes from the American flag to recreate sort of like a Caribbean American flag with these people and how we see ourselves. And again, that's another form of uh, assimilation to a new place, new location. It's about survival. Same with these, the images are collaged in Photoshop and then picked over and collaged again on the surface. There's some paint in various places, these images. And these are picotage again. These are from my show in 2019, uh, Junction. And these are all my photos, if you have any, if you ever wonder. They're, they're all my images. And most of my images are shot on 35 millimeter and then transferred to digital and printed. And a lot of these breeze blocks, I was, you know, I, I draw them out and color pencil on the surface and then pick away at them. But it's thinking about veils and disguise and how to really hide information. I 
And I included this Bob Thompson uh, painting in here because of uh, his connection to the spiritual realm in the way that he was uh, painting in a very Renaissance style. And I felt it was appropriate to like talk about his connection to uh, how I saw these images from the uh, carnival. I took this image in London at the Notting Hill Carnival in 2019, the last Notting Hill Carnival before uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I was very much thinking about the Paramount Blue Devils and just how ghosts come out at night, but also, you know, the way how I learned about ghosts or spirits is that you must... Uh, be receptive of them, you know? We can't be fearful of the unknown. We only could learn from what we're, we're experiencing. And this is another one to that. This is Midnight Blue number two. I believe this work is being shown at the Katzen Art Museum in DC in a month or so, if you're in DC. And if you're wondering, this image is like 96 by 72. And I'm printing these in the studio and seaming them when they get mounted. So I'm printing them in two strips and um, mounting them together. And this is my most recent show in New York at uh, Jack Shaneman Gallery uh, called Tradewinds. And it's, you know, since 2019, I kind of went around to various Caribbean islands to really get a sense of them in thinking about Jamaica, which some of the work inside in the gallery right now is called Centering the Periphery and just thinking of the other islands around Jamaica, which is sort of like the center of the Caribbean and all the influences of Jamaica and all on these other islands. Sometimes like I have images that I want to work with and I have them printed, I blow them up. And it's hard when you know the individuals in these works. Uh, it's hard to like talk about them because like I'm still digesting from you know the, 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 the making of them and seeing them in the studio. And it's, I think you know years will go by and I remember something about an image because when I shoot these images, I create albums uh, of all the four by six images. I go back and look through them and spend time with them. Um, and they could become complicated because they're personal. And sometimes I can't give out all the personal information, you know? I'm only trying to give you just a little slice of what they are. Because I'm the one behind the camera. I know what happened before and after those images. Um, and this one's called Eyes, Eyes for the Tropics. And it's more so to think about Europeans' uh, eye on the tropics and how you know most of the Caribbean was cultivated for tourism and how the uh, Kodak company was used to sort of uh, propagate travelers to the Caribbean in the 19th and 20th century. And much of these architect, uh, architectural elements are from the Moorish architecture from North Africa. And going around, I began to like 
try to understand like where this information comes from. Because you see it on houses, everyone wants their house to look like somebody else's houses, house, but you have no idea where what the root of this thing comes from, right? Like, I, I guess what, tomatoes are not Italian, they're like Mexican, so n no one really knows the, you know, the root of certain things. It's just like taken on, borrowed, grow, and grown. And so this is part of searching, you know, like, where am I from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? This is actually in Barbados uh, from, I think, 2018 or 19. But I made the work in 2021. Yeah. And now this is a new Dreams of Fur series. So this body of work, you know, started in 2016, but I was thinking of making them in this way in 2014. And so sometimes the pro there's a lot of things that happen in the progress and process of making these works that, you know, don't get seen. All the first, probably like 30 of these, I've kept the drawings and the sketches and the prints, and I've, if they've been out in the world, I ask for them back. Uh, and so I started making these on a uh, larger scale in 2020 for a commission, and that fell through, which I was happy. And <laughs> um, I kept making them until I started showing them and include them in group presentations. But the dreams, the, the title came from uh, Langston Hughes, The Dreams Deferred, you know, thinking about how to maintain the dreams and the American dream. And everything for me goes back to like what, who I am, why am I here? What am I doing? I'm in America. How do I maintain and care for this dream? And also, being in New York, I see a lot of uh, potential NBA players uh, on the basketball courts. And oftentimes, these basketball courts are in these contentious places where they're uh, placed in these fences, chain link fence parks. And so you see these groups of men or women playing basketball, and you start to really think about them. But then, uh, down the street from my old studio, there was this garden, and it was like, beautiful, you know, there's all these flowers in it, began photographing this garden, and I'm not sure why I started photographing this garden. And I realized it's that I was attracted to the flowers, but also there was these, uh, there was this uh, calisthen area for calisthenics to work out, and so I was like thinking about all these men working out, but also um, thinking about just how the flowers and working out, testosterone, these, uh, just a lot of complicated ideas, right? You know, testosterone leads to a lot of like evil right now. You've seen it, you're hearing it in the news. It's kind of uh, a lot of wicked. And so I'm thinking about how these flowers sort of like beautify the space, but also there are these fence, they were fenced in and how they, I, w I was sort of like kept out of the space, but also thinking about the juxtaposition of these two things, right? And so I started, painting over them, calling them dreams deferred because of how these dreams could get deferred easily in the American landscape, right? You mess up one time, you're, you know, arrested, it's always in the public record, you know, NFL player says, um, I heard this recently where a player said, the best way to get your career dismantled is going 15 over the speed limit, out after 12, have a gun on you while you're drinking and being arrested or get a DUI. And so I was like thinking about that, but also we've seen a lot of basketball players who are high one, uh, on a basketball high one year and then you don't hear from them anymore. And in New York, it's like the home of basketball, right? And I started to think about that and how to really present that within the work that I was doing because I, I visit basketball courts often. This past weekend, I was on a basketball court in Orchard Beach, and so there are these places that I enjoy being around, and I'm just thinking about how could black men, and particularly, um, have more care for those dreams and really nurture them for longevity. And so these are oil stick over photos again. So I consider them paintings. That's it. Thank you.
Well, we have a few minutes. Um, so who's got the first question? I'll, I'll give you the mic and, and then you can uh, maybe ask it then. So this is where the questions come How up. Did, hey, how you doing? Hi. Thank you for um, sharing that with us. My first question is like, how do you dictate what's seen and what's not seen with like this pictog me method? Especially like when these images like exist in these spaces that they are like does that make sense like especially dealing with like the vulnerability and like the power of like the black gaze um just how do you navigate that like with your materials so i would say you know <laughs> recently i've been working on multiple things at once and in the past i'd only work on one figurative work at a time because I didn't want the image to be staring at me while I was working on something else because I would think about the figure within that image a whole lot. And so I'd pick up, the, if I knew the person, I'd pick up the phone and call someone who knew them or I would call them and speak to them casually. But oftentimes it's, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. I, I, you know, almost everything is online now. And for me, it's, I also don't make additions of any work, so everything is all one-off, and I really try to pick the image completely to where it distorts the figure and change who they are. Does that answer your question, or does that help with what you're asking? It's hard for me, you know, it's like, it's hard to put somebody's business out there, and it's hard, like, sometimes I will not speak about certain images because I know what they are like, you know? It's just a memory. Hey, it's nice to hear you speak about your work and to hear about your trajectory uh, after 2010 when I started college next door. One thing that I have been thinking about in my studio is there are two essays. One, Elaine Locke's uh, Ancestral Arts, and then there's a book called um, African Art, the Art That Conceals and Reveals. And I was wondering if you've either read those books or essays and or could you share some of the things that are touchstones in your studio that you're reading? and helping you navigate uh, through some of the spaces that the previous person was trying to ask you about? You know, I read various books. I read a lot of things about immigration, basically more so uh, Stuart Hall or uh, Krista, Krista Angelique Thompson's book, Eye for the Tropics, that really talks about just the Caribbean and how the Caribbean is seen from the outside eyes. and. I got really interested in a lot of African masks because of the way how masks disguise, you know, we're all wearing masks right now, disguise your, some parts of your identity. And within those masks, it's dis disguising your entire uh, face. And so with that, I was, I was reading much more so um, museum texts on masks and how those play into how we function Whenever it becomes, uh, we all have a, diff a ma we all wear a mask, even when we're not physically wearing a mask. Uh, I think a good amount of you in the audience know who I am, and some most of you don't know who I am. Uh, but it's for me, it's how we carry ourselves. And I did not read those two books, but I truly think uh, masks help us to cope with our daily activities, right? And in, in New York where I am, I wear a mask the moment I'm out the door. I'm not the same person. Like that vulnerability is not there. I'm protecting myself because I'm going from point A to point B. And so that's how I think about these people in these images is how to really show them. And sometimes it's really hard. It's really hard. And I'm getting to a point now where I'm, I'm not, you know, I still take, photos of individuals, but I'm not trying to show them 
as they are. You know, once the music comes on, once you're having a drink, that uh, mask drops a little bit, you know, you're a bit more vulnerable. Once you're drinking, you're a bit relaxed, you know. Uh, we all have been there. I think most of us has been there. I can't talk for everyone. But uh, that's how I see it, you know. It's probably, I have a lot of books. There's others that I probably can't think of right now, but I borrow a lot. Uh, how about here on House Right? Does anyone over here have a question? Yeah, great. Could you pass this microphone? Sorry, thank you. Your work in the gallery is so intriguing in the way that as you walk past many of the images, they change completely several times. And I'm very curious as to your technique, how you achieve that and the tools that you use. I use one tool, and th thank you by the way. Uh, I use one tool and I study ceramics in the building across the way, and I, as I mentioned, while I was at Anderson Ranch Art Center in 2012, I began scratching, using my needle tool, ceramic needle tool, to scratch on the surface of various photos that I was, or images that I was copying from a Time Magazine book from the 1960s. And I was scratching, and over time, while scratching and picking, it got more developed to where I change the diameter of the tool that I was using to where it bec became like a, what, a two millimeter chisel. So I'm picking in different directions. So when I'm in the studio, I'm picking in one direction and I flip the work upside down to pick from another direction so that when you walk past it, the works, you're starting to see this uh, sort of lenticular image that be starts to become a bit more camouflage. And then in some ways, because they're figurative, they become to take on different spirits. Uh, of what you're seeing, you know? I think that's why when you drink and you get drunk, it's also, you know, it's, your spirit comes out, why it's also called spirits. Wine and spirits, you know, it's like, it's bringing out another part of who you actually are. So that's, you know, I, I guess it has like a lot of meaning when it talks about masking identities and your inhibitions, lowering them. Hi, um, thank you for sharing. And uh, as someone with Caribbean heritage, your work really resonated with me. And something I wanted to ask you is, um, you talk about assimilation in the States and survival, but do you, talk, do you think about that on the flip side, like back home and how, something that I think about with my own culture is about how so much of the culture, it's almost a painful realization. It wouldn't be what it is without colonization. And I was wondering if that's something you ever explore in your work. You know, I think without colonization, I probably wouldn't be here, right? Yeah. Because my, grand, my great grandparents died in a fire in Cuba in a sugarcane field, uh, as told by my grandfather. And he was brought to Jamaica when he was really young. And so like these little, you know, these little moments have an effect that plays out on a larger scale. And so, you know, like I, uh, everything that I do is showing a picture and those pictures take a quick second, right? I'm not showing you the second before or the second after what I choose to show you. And the same thing when we watch, I hate watching TV, by the way, aside from basketball. But, <laughs> but when, you, when you see these things, you know, you have to wonder like what, are they trying to sell you on the screen? And even like when I go back home, like I'm told that I'm American, right? And so it's kind of like you don't belong in either place. When you're in America, you're told that you're an immigrant. When you go back home, you're like, you're an American, you're a Yankee or whatever that, that it's called. So it's kind of like, it's this, and, and it's this complicated place. And so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, where do you belong, right? And that's why it's all survival. You're still, you're trying to survive to just, you know, hold your own, live out the 75 years of life that everyone gets uh, and move to the next stage, right? So, and I, and I guess sometimes in those down, down, those down moments, you're, you, you build up motivation to move on to the next uh, stage, right? 
it's all trials for the long run. Okay, I have a selfish question. Um, why did you leave working with Clay? <laughs> and like, what, <laughs> sorry. And what, like, how is that, like, working with that material though informed the work you make now, aside from like the tools um, you've been using? So I studied Clay in school. Um, but to me, school is just to get you motivated so that you know what you want to do in the long term. You know, I think most uh, students from the Art Institute don't really practice making art um, anymore. And I didn't plan on making clay works or after school. I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was painting at home uh, even when I was making uh, ceramic objects in the department. Clay is just another medium to talk, make, you know, to speak about or create stories about. And so I find that painting and photography was more so an, an expedient way for me to do that, but also try new things. Also, having the facilities of clay, uh, you have to make space for that. And one of the things that I, I, I was frustrated with uh, was the dust. I, I was not a fan of the clay dust. Uh, and even now, you know, um, I think about making, going back to clay frequently. I speak about clay often. Uh, but I, I, I worked in clay because I like to cook. And I always said if I didn't make art, I would go and work in the restaurant industry because I, that was another place that I found uh, interesting, the culinary arts. Um, but yeah, clay is always there. Did I, you had another part of that question? It's not really selfish either. I, I could tell. Um, back on the right side of the house, anyone over here have any questions? I want to be fair. Oh yeah. Let's go right side. I have a question about the picking. Like, is it very just superficial and surface for you? Or is it soulful and it's pattern? Like, is there a history and a lineage to the pattern? You know, I, I usually keep a bottle of Tylenol in my studio because I find something meditative about picking. And once I'm done, sometimes in the studio, I take breaks. I take like a month or two off from picking because my wrists begin to hurt. And so I go in and I make those oil stick paintings because they're much softer and less stressful on the wrist. Um, and whenever I pick the, those images, there's a lot of thinking that goes on. I, sometimes I'm like researching things on my phone. I'm looking up random. I'm, I, 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 there's, there's a lot that I look at while I'm working on picking these images. It's not just me picking all day and, you know, like, the reason why I started making the Dreams Deferred works also is because, like, while I was picking in the studio, I'd walk across the street and do dips to build up my shoulders because this action actually starts in the shoulders and goes down the arm. Uh, so it's all kind of relates, you know. And, Or not really, it's just random. Sometimes it changes on how I feel, but also I use the patterns to think about camouflage and distinctively break up the information, sort of like how oh, this is also camouflage. It's Frank Stella or this other work over here. There's a lot of uh, patterns that could be picked into the photos, but also break them up into algorithms and structures to conceal information. Is that could you raise your hand if you have a question? I see one over there. Um, okay, and let me uh, let me run over here, and I'm going to come back to you. Let me. I'm going to go over here first, and then I'm going <laughs> to. You mentioned your creativity for cooking. I was just curious about your favorite dish. Curry chicken and white rice. Okay, I'm going to. I'll be right over. 
Okay. Any questions? Uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you already kind of asked one, didn't you? I she, need to she, ask you. All right, that's great. <laughs> hey, again. Yeah. Um, how fast do you make your works? And like, does like that pace um, depend on any demand? You know, I make the. You know, a lot of work I make and I don't show it. I like to be honest with you. I don't really care about demand. My main interest is, is the image like final, is it complete? And so I try to work on things from start to finish. And the larger work in the gallery uh, on the back wall, that was on the wall for about, in the studio for about four or five months. And it's because I was working on multiple things and it, it was like, it became painstaking starting and stopping and starting and stopping when I could, you know, have more fun making smaller works. The larger works takes time. And I like making the larger works. I think I'm gonna make another larger work soon, but larger than that one, because there's something interesting about them. And when I make these larger works, uh, I was telling someone recently that I look at a lot of uh, abstract paintings, like Clifford Still, uh, Ellen Frankenthal, uh, Frankenthaler, uh, the Coonings, um, it, it, the list goes on. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about space, I'm thinking about open space and horizontal fields. If, you know, just thinking about abstract landscapes and how they help me to create what I'm doing, even though they, there's probably no correlation other than scale. So it's like sizing up other works and most of, the, most of the works I'll make and I'll have them, and I don't show them for a few months, or I make work for myself that nobody gets to see. So for me, it's important to make the work regardless of what the demand is. And even if the work doesn't sell or go anywhere, I'm happy to get it back. Like. Okay, I think we're gonna have time for about two more questions. First one is over here. Hello. Um, I wanted to know, like, for your work in general, how do you manage your work? And because it seems like it takes a very long time for you to even complete a work, how, how do you manage your main lifestyle and how what you do, it, like, throughout the day of your life and putting in your work with that? And is there sacrifices that you have to make? So when it's sunny and nice outside, right? I, uh, I feel guilty that I'm not in the studio. Like I have a window out, you know, at the back of the studio and like while I'm working, I look outside the window and I'm like, it looks nice outside, but I'd rather be in the studio working. And if, you know, when I leave the studio, I'm either at the grocery store or I go home. Like I, you know, you will lose friends because in order to have friends, you must be a friend and show up for them and be supportive. And most times I rather just go home, go to the grocery store or go to the studio. I wake up and all I want to do is get a coffee and go to the studio. I'll leave the studio, uh, go to the corner store, get a slice of pizza. I'll feed the birds, drink my coffee while it's hot, black coffee, and I get right back to the studio. And once I feel like I'm complete for the day, I go home and I give myself a schedule because, you know, I don't have anyone in my, I have one friend that worked for me last year, helped me to make a few things. Um, and usually I just like to be in the studio alone. I like to get lost in what I'm doing. There's a lot of things that I'm doing. I might shoot a roll of film. I might go downtown and drop it off and leave it there for like four or five days after I could have collected it because I'm still, uptown trying to get something else done and then I'll shoot another roll so that when I go to pick that one up I drop another roll off because I'm trying to like maximize everything that I do and once I get that roll back I get to the studio I put those all in an album I flip through them I scan a few of them in I'm like okay I could print this one I turn the printer on I print an image and then I'll print like 10 images and then like the next day before I get to the studio I'll go into Long Island City I'll drop those off so that in a week or two they could come back to me so I could start working on them. So there's all these little things that I really think about my time. I'm always checking the time and thinking about how to really maximize my time because 
you know, if I had 28 hours in one day, I was still wishing that I had more time. So uh, it's a matter of like how you try to work around that, you know, or like I'll call one of you in the audience, you know, like while I'm working and I'll talk about something and catch up while I'm working or I usually speak to my mom while I'm working and she's like, oh, you're still picking. Like, she's like, Paul, you can't take a break. I'm like, no, I'm, you know, she, she's always like, yo, you have a lot of work. She's like, man, I wish you had a break. And I'm like, but I want to be here. I don't want to be anywhere else. And I used to leave and go places for two weeks. And now two weeks turn into four or five days. I like, I really want to be back in the studio. Like I told someone today, like, I just got here yesterday. I'm like, I can't wait to get back to the studio. <laughs> like, you know, there's a lot of things happening, like things on the wall that like I really want to get going, you know. And so that's, uh, that's the short answer. Uh, I like being in the studio. Like, Last call for questions. I think just one more. Does anyone have one? We've got one right over here. And then I'm going to send it over to... Executive Director, Sean O'Hara. It's such an honor to have you here. Um, your presentation was amazing. Um, I have to say, though, your, uh, philosoph um, your, your philosophical outlook that's within your artwork is brilliant, by the way. Um, and um, I, I know, like I expressed to you earlier, there's a piece that meant a lot to me. Is there a piece that you've created that means like uh, something really important to you that that's, was you're very dear to you. That's, that, that's hard because it's like, you know, if you have a few kids, it's like, you can't really say that they're all, they're, you know, you have a favorite, even though you have a favorite, because like, <laughs> I make work from different series and there's things that I make that I'm like, ah, oh, you can't see this. Like, there's things that I make from, you know, yeah, there's works, but I don't know if I could tell you them or I don't remember what they are, but there's works. Like, I really enjoy seeing works that I made years ago. And so whenever I see them, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that thing. I had to take the, the, the oh, boar hair weird. bristle off the paint because it got stuck. Or, or I remember scratching through that image and I had to pick through it. You know, like, I could go back and tell you moments that I really encountered, like, certain difficult, they're not difficult, but just very small decisions from each one of them because they're like, they're all my offsprings, right? So I really try to care for them. Like even part of like, you're going back to what she asked about how my day is like, you know, part of making these work is thinking about the final presentation. And so like, I have to think about like, when I walked in there today, I really looked at the frames. I remember like, oh, that was made at such and so. You know, I remember, the, you know, I looked at the corners to make sure that they're holding up. Like there's things, you know, I still care for them, right? Uh, so it's just part of the process. You like them all, you know, like there's moments that you've had with them all. You know, there's like, I know when, yeah, like there's, I could go on and on, but like there, it, there's, it's an obsession, right? Like, and I think because I don't make additions, like I get obsessed about every individual work. So appreciate it. Oh, thank you all.